last Sunday, I had the second most difficult funeral service to officiate as a pastor. <clears throat> the most difficult funeral service I've ever officiated happened almost four years ago. I was standing at the bedside of a baby girl, three month old, Mia. She was surrounded by family. And then somebody had to pull the plug. She was on life support. The machine was doing the breathing for her. And then her little heart slowed down to the point where it just stopped. This tragedy inspired her mom, who at that time was a doctoral student in criminal law, to start an organization, an organization that would bring awareness about human trafficking. Human trafficking, especially of children, and especially for sex trafficking. It was in this very painful context that God started opening my eyes to a very cruel reality happening in this world. Children, often under the age of 10, abducted and turned into slaves for the rest of their lives. It is a, an extremely painful reality because once they get in that swamp of illegal things, robbery, prostitution, proxenitism, drugs, drug dealing, it is very hard to get out, almost impossible. This Monday, as I was traveling back from Florida, from the funeral, I watched a threefold presentation or three one hour presentation of uh, somebody's life. A young lady, probably close to 40 at this time, giving her testimony about how she got into that world and then how she got out of there. She was 15 when she ran away from home. 15, along with a friend, another girl, 14. They both were fooled, actually abducted by two older boys who were showing very nice attitudes toward them, promising them that as soon as they get over the border, they will have wonderful jobs and they will have their own money. It was a desire and an attempt to evade from uh, the poor circumstances, environment they lived in. Of course, once they were taken out there, they were sold into prostitution. And from there, one thing happened after the other. By God's intervention, 
because according to this lady that I will call Linda, and I'm calling her Linda because even after 20 plus years of that swamp of um, illegal and evil things that she experienced and did to others, she still was beautiful. And she was saying that less than 1% of those that get in those situations can get out. Because the moment they want to leave, it's too late for them to leave. They are threatened, beaten, they can be even killed if they want to get out. Now, you should not imagine that everything they experience there is just uh, misery. Some of them work their way up to a very wealthy and um, pleasurable life in some ways. But that pleasure is always connected to those illegal and even evil things that they have to do. What impressed me in uh, the story of this young lady is that Throughout this 20 plus years experience of the swamp of sin that she experienced herself and uh, she made other people to experience because at one point she became a pimp, a woman pimp, a proxenate using others in the business, in the industry. She always felt drawn by God. And the most tangible way she felt that attraction, somebody pulling on her, uh, somebody wooing her, was in her desire to, go, to do good things. She said, at one point I was imagining myself as a Robin Hood taking money from the wealthy, helping out the poor. And sometimes she would feel good about doing that. But then in reality, she was experiencing a nightmare. She wanted out. And when she wanted out, she was told, no, no, no. If you want to leave, you are going to pay with your life. In the end, God uh, used some people and they were helped to get out. Both of them, Linda and her one year younger friend. One year after they broke free, this friend committed suicide. She couldn't bear the pressure of real life outside of that environment. Then uh, through a chain of very uh, disappointing and uh, discouraging and distressful and depressive and even despair events in her life, Linda's heart was eventually won over by Jesus Christ, the one that was drawing on her all the way through. And now she is a baptized Seventh-day Adventist and a therapist in one of our health institutions. Yes, a prostitute, a robber, a proxenate or pimp, a drug consumer, a drug dealer, that seems to be drawn by somebody and feels the urge of go doing good things toward others. Matthew chapter 26, starting with verse 6, is the story of a Linda. Matthew 26.
verse 6 and onward. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you don't have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to, please tell me what word is missing, to, wouldn't you have expected for Jesus to say, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to me? I saw you had that reflex. But that's not what it says. It says, what this woman has done, what did this woman do? She did some waste. He wasted some fragrant oil, some perfume or ointment. What this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. So we are building here and now a memorial to that woman. Why? Because Jesus said so. Because she did a good thing, Jesus said, for me. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you take possession of our hearts and minds and lift Jesus Christ the Savior up in his beauty in his attractiveness, because in his name we pray, amen. We are two, way, two days before Jesus' crucifixion. In uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 2, Jesus predicts, he says, you know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Two days. Now, at this time, the plotting of his enemy against him is heavily happening. They want to take him by trickery, kill him, but they don't want to do it during the feast. Why not during the feast? They are afraid of the mob. They don't want them to rise up. And because they are afraid, they want to push it a little bit. Jesus tells us, no, it's going to be in two days. Did it happen in two days? Yes, it did. Why? Because there was a miscalculation in their equation. What was the miscalculation? Well, the miscalculation was a surprise element they could not take in calculation. And the name of that surprise element was Judas. Judas. Somebody that offered to betray him, to give him over. Now, interestingly, this story of a woman that comes and pours fragrant oil on the body of Jesus Christ before his crucifixion appears in all four Gospels. Matthew 26 and, Matthew, and Mark 14 
are rendering the story almost with the same details. But then there is Luke chapter 7 and John chapter 12, where the story is rendered somewhat differently. Some would say it's the same story from a different perspective. And if that's true, then we find from John chapter 12 that this event with the lady that poured fragrant oil on Jesus' body actually happened some more days before the crucifixion, not two days, six days before. And from Luke, we get to know that the woman that poured the fragrant oil was a sinful woman. And that's a nice way of a doctor, Dr. Luke, speaking about a woman that really was sinful. We also find that the house of the person where they had the party was Simon the leper, a former leper that was healed, but he was also a Pharisee. A very complex situation in which somebody comes and pours fragrant oil on Jesus Christ's body. And Jesus looks at what she's doing. And in spite of the fact that the disciples have a problem with the waste, and they have a very good work, they want to point out why they have a problem with the waste, the poor. Have you noticed how often we tend to use the poor as a good work to hide a bad work? Yes. Do something ugly and then use the poor. What we find from John chapter 12 is that, in fact, the one that stirred the agitation with regard to the waste was none else than the surprise element of the equation, Judas, a finance expert that knew how to use the cause of the poor. Is the cause of the poor, helping the poor, a good thing? It's a great thing to help those in need. And this guy was an expert to use the cause of the poor as a good work to hide a bad work because he, in fact, was a thief. He knew how to use the money of the group for his own interest so that everybody would think all his heart cares for is the poor. Now, whether all those four stories should be harmonized or not, here in Matthew chapter 26, one thing is obvious. There are two stories placed by Matthew side by side. One is described in a beautiful chiastic structure. And by now you should know when I say chiastic structure, a chiasm is like a house top, a roof, that has a climax, a peak. And the peak of the chiastic structure in which Jesus Christ speaks about the woman, about what she did. The good work of the woman is exactly this. If you look at verse 10, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. That's the most important element of the story. A woman a sinful woman did a good thing for him. What is the next story? Well, just read on 
from verse 14. Then one of the twelve, what's his name? Oh, you got it. So there is a reason why the two stories are placed side by side. Here you have a woman, a sinful woman, that does a good work when everybody thinks she does actually what? A bad work. A waste. A waste of resources. resources. And then you have the guy that everybody thinks he's up to do some good work. Well, in fact, this is what he's doing. And this is human sinful character. Hide a bad work behind a good work. And Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests, verse 15, and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? He's doing a good thing, right? For the priests. And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver meaning he sells Jesus into slavery. Verse 16, so from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Two attitudes side by side. Good work, Jesus says it's good work. And good work, a concern for the poor. Everybody thinks that's good work. Is it? Of course it is. The problem is a good work is being used as a shield to protect yourself from being discovered that you are actually hiding a bad work. Let me ask you, what makes the difference between a good work and a good work? What is it? Intention. What is it in one word? What is it? Motives. Thank you. What is it? Sincerity, honesty, what is it? Sin, okay, what is it? What's in it for me, okay, pretty modern. Yeah, what's in it for me? What does, m- what does make the difference between good work and good work? Desire of Ages, page 563. I love the way Ellen White concludes the essence of this story. She says, Until time should be no more, that broken alabaster box would tell the story of the, what? Abundant love of God for a fallen race. What makes the difference between good work and good work? Love. Whose love? Is it God's love for that woman? Because obviously that woman is wooed. She's attracted. She's pulled in somehow, in a way that disturbs the people around them. Is it Jesus' love toward the women? Or the women's love toward Jesus? Are those loves two different loves? Ellen White says in Desire of Ages, I think page 22, only love can awaken What? Love. 
And that's the essence of the story. When love awakens love and brings that person back to the lover. And that's called by Jesus a good work for me. And that's what makes the woman a monument whose memory we celebrate here and now. Amen.